Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA A Plus certification course. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk all about printers and scanners. We're going to go through an introduction, things you'll need to know for exam 220 601, section 4.1, that tells us that we need to identify differences between printer and scanner technologies. Also, the 220 602 exam requires that we also describe processes used by printer scanners, which deal with all of these different kinds of printers and different scanning technologies. And we're going to step through each one of those. In fact, we're going to start with printers and what we can expect to find, usually in large environments with printers. We'll talk a little bit about the home office as well. But there are a lot of different technologies with laser jets and ink jets and other types that we're going to get into. We're also going to talk about scanner technologies and what you might expect to see in scanners. Scanners aren't quite as prevalent as printers are, but still an important technology and used quite a bit in enterprises today. And finally, we'll talk about all-in-one devices. Uh, the CompT exam doesn't specifically mention all-in-one devices, but you're going to run into these things more often, which combine not only printing and scanning, but also other capabilities. Abilities. Let's start our introduction of printer technologies with the laser printer. Laser printers have become extremely popular not only in the enterprise, but also in home offices because their price point has really come down in the last few years. This is a combination of a lot of different kinds of technologies. There is a laser beam inside of this. There's a lot of voltage. There are charged ions, powdered ink in the form of toner. We have heat and pressure, and finally paper. And you put all of these things together, and you have this laser printer output. Laser printers became popular because they provide a very, very high quality output. Today, that output is not only black and white, but also color laser copies. So this is striking on how, how, how good the quality is, how high the quality is of these outputs if you ever see them, really beyond any other kind of, of printing technology you're going to find in the enterprise. And they're very fast. When you're working in a business environment and you need that output because you're going to a meeting, you're going to meet with clients, you need to grab that information and go don't have a lot of time to sit there and wait for these printouts to come out. So this is a, a very nice technology to use when speed is of the essence. Unfortunately, they're extremely complex technologies. We mentioned all of those different pieces inside of this. There are a lot of moving parts inside of this, a lot of things that can go wrong. It's almost like a copying machine and how it operates. And so there's a lot of things you have to take care of and maintain inside of a laser printer. This laser printer also prints a page at a time. It doesn't do a little bit of a page at a time. It prints an entire page at a time. Time. So there's a lot of memory that's contained inside of laser printers, much more memory than you would find in any other kind of printing technology that you'll see. And on the inside, there is quite a mess if you go in there and start doing maintenance of them. The powdered ink, that toner that's inside of a laser printer, tends to get everywhere. And if there's any that ever leaks out, and some does occasionally get out a little bit inside of the machine, you'll find that as the years go on, these get messier and messier inside. It's very difficult to clean everything out of the inside. Laser printing itself is, as I mentioned, building an entire image of the page, which is why that memory is so important. And it does this through something that we call raster image processing. As our PC is sending an image to this laser printer, it's building that inside of the memory. And as soon as it gets an entire page in memory, it begins to print. Now, laser printers use different languages to be able to do this. One of them, and one of the very earliest kind, is something called Adobe PostScript. This is a very common processing language that's very descriptive. It's the communication language that's used between your computer and the printer. And it's this page description language that can then build that page out. Now, PostScript also is used uh, even today in very, very high quality printing environments, especially at a printer or a graphic artist type environment. But most common use of printing languages with this raster image processing is probably found with HP's extremely popular line of printers. They came up with their own language called HP Printer Command Language. So if you're shopping around for laser printer, you'll notice that laser printers will say, this is a PostScript printer. This is a PCL printer, especially the HP line. And so you'll know when you get that, when you're ready to load the drivers for this printer, you need a driver that's compatible with the printer that you just acquired. A brand new kind of image processing, relatively new on the scene, is one from Microsoft. This is the Microsoft XML page specification. And it's Microsoft's way of taking some of the shortcomings in PostScript and in PCL and creating one specifically for Windows, but it could be used in any operating system. And it's another page description language that really allows Microsoft to take advantage of the operating system within Windows to create very high quality copies. 
if you ever take the file that's been created by a PostScript output and you have a look at what's being sent to the printer, this is what you'll see. So us humans can make out some of this. There's some kind of words in here, DUP 61, one put, pop, and then a bunch of letters and numbers and settings. And some of this just uh, looks very, very unusual. But when the printer receives this PostScript information, it takes all of these characters and puts them together into what might make up a letter, what might make up a graphic. Maybe you're printing out a picture. All of these things are understood by the printer, and it has no problem understanding this. Now you can start to see why it's important that if it's a, po a PostScript printer that you send PostScript language to it. Because if you take this information and you send it to a PCL printer, it will have no idea what you're talking about. It will not be able to create the page and then finally print it out. So if you're in a situation where you're trying to find out why your PostScript printer isn't printing and you look at the printer and the physical printer isn't a PostScript printer, it's an HP PCL printer, then you'll know you have an incompatibility there. Those things have to match up. This is the inside of a laser printer. What we're going to do is step through the entire process. What I have here is a cross section of a laser printer output. So we're looking at this from the side and watching things go through. Across the bottom, for instance, is our paper going through. So let's step step by step go through what really happens when this is now ready to print something. The first step is there is a cleaning process that takes place. Inside your laser printer is this photosensitive drum. You don't want any light to get in that drum. It's usually contained on your toner cartridge that you're replacing in the printer occasionally. And that photosensitive drum, it has a cover on top of it. And in fact, if you take an old toner cartridge, you can look inside of there and you can move back the bar that protects that photosensitive drum from the light. You'll see this green drum in inside of that. That's what that is. You want to be sure you don't get any light on that if you want to ever use that photosensitive drum again. So the first step is that there is toner that's left on the drum from the last time it was used. So it's very important that we get rid of that toner. So there is a plastic cleaning process that takes place inside of there that removes any excess toner from that drum as it is spinning around when we start to print. The second step in our laser printing process is to negatively charge the photosensitive drum. We are sending an ionic charge through a wire in our laser printer that is going to take this drum and every part of the drum will be negatively charged. This is very important because our toner is also going to be negatively charged. And what we're doing is essentially creating a clean slate. It's like taking an Etch-a-Sketch and shaking it and cleaning it off. And nothing now sticks to the front of that photosensitive drum. So now we want to be able to draw something into the drum and essentially remove those negative ions. And we doing that do that by writing an image. So whether we're sending text, whether we're sending a picture, there's a laser inside of this that's reflecting off of a mirror. And that laser is essentially drawing an image onto this photosensitive drum. That means that when it gets to the fourth step where the, the toner is actually connecting with the photosensitive drum, that only the parts of the drum that have been touched with the laser will have that negatively charged toner connecting to it. Now that we've written our image directly onto the photosensitive drum, we've essentially removed the negative ions from that section. And we have these negatively charged toner particles, these little pieces of ink that are, are in a, a solid form. They're in a powdery form. And they're going to stick to the part of the photosensitive drum where the laser touched it. So this might be text. It might be images. It's whatever our laser happened to write into that photosensitive drum. So we haven't connected it to the paper yet. That's our next step. So step five is to transfer what is on the photosensitive drum and have it stick to the paper. And as it's rotating through, it sticks to that process. So now we've taken our image. We've written it to the photosensitive drum. We've stuck some ink onto where we've written that image. And then we've slid it right onto the paper. Now the paper has a copy of that toner on it. We have transferred that information directly to the paper. But it's not stuck on there permanently yet. If you ever pull out a paper that might be jammed inside of your laser printer and you find it's coming right off on your fingers, that's because it hasn't gone through the last process of fusing the toner onto the paper. This now gets heated up and there's pressure that essentially melts the toner and sticks it onto the paper so that it won't come off. And when it finally comes out of your laser printer on the other side, that now that toner cartridge is now permanently stuck to that piece. 
Now this doesn't exactly finish what's going on. Not all of that toner gets stuck to the paper. There's a little residual part that continues on through the other side of the photosensitive drum. And that's why that cleaning process is there so that the entire thing can happen all over again. You may be asked this process on your A-plus exam. It may say, what is the process that it takes? What comes first? What comes second? What comes third? And as long as you understand this general process, you'll probably do just fine, even if the same words aren't used. We know that first we have to clean the drum. We have to charge it with negative ions. Our laser then writes an image in the third step. The fourth step is to actually stick the toner onto the section where we wrote something into the photosensitive drum. We transfer that toner onto the paper. And finally, we heat it up and apply pressure to fuse that toner onto the paper and send it outside of the laser printer. So as long as you have a general idea about exactly how all this works, then you'll have no problem on the exam. Another very common type of printer, both in the enterprise and in home use, is something called an ink dispersion printer. This is an inkjet printer. You'll hear the word inkjet probably more than you hear ink dispersion. But it's called that because we're dispersing the ink onto the paper. We're essentially blowing that ink out in many different ways. There are many different technologies that do this. But it's a relatively inexpensive technology. There's not a lot of heat involved. There's not a lot of high voltage involved. There's no laser beams in inkjet printing. So it's a relatively inexpensive technology. It's also very quiet. Laser printers have motors in them. They have to apply a lot of heat. And you hear them when they're operating. Inkjet printers can be relatively quiet because all you're doing is spraying a little bit of ink onto the paper, which means that you can have it in a home and home office or in a small office environment and not cause a lot of disruption. You can be on the telephone at the same time as your printer is going. These ink dispersion printers are also very high quality these days. The, most of the newest kind are printing out very beautiful pictures and photographs. So people are no longer developing pictures from their digital cameras. They're just sending them off to their inkjet printers and printing them there. Unfortunately, the ink inside of an inkjet printer is relatively expensive. It's a proprietary method of, that the cartridge uses to put information or the ink so that it comes out onto our paper. And that ink can be pretty expensive if you start adding it up. In some cases, it is less expensive to send your pictures off to be developed because the ink just costs so much. I think that's how they get you. And the ink, unfortunately, is not permanent. It will fade over time, especially if it is subjected to light. There's special inks you can get for your inkjet printers that will last a little bit longer. But of course, they'll be a little bit more expensive as well. Inkjet printers also tend to clog because we're dealing with ink. And we are spraying it through tiny little nozzles. Those nozzles tend to clog up. And there are, are cleaning processes that most printers will do automatically every day just to make sure it continues to blow that ink through there and it doesn't clog up. But you have to watch that if you're taking an inkjet printer and you're putting it in the closet for a little while and you want to use that later, just keep in mind that you may have to unclog or work on sending this, this inkjet printer off to be maintained if you pull it out and it's not printing properly. Another type of printer that you still see around, but it's a relatively old technology, is something called a dot matrix printer. Now, it's called dot matrix because it's, it's literally creating pictures and letters from dots that are on the paper. So I've given you a close-up here of what an uh, inkjet paper might look like. And here's an old Okie data, Microline 320 Elite. You see these a lot in environments that need to do carbon copies or multiple copies of forms. So the forms will be fed through. They have the little holes in the paper on the side. And because this is physically using pins to hit the paper through a ribbon of ink, then it's able to create multiple copies simultaneously. Can't do that with a laser printer, and you can't do that with an inkjet printer. So this becomes very useful in environments where you need those multiple copies. There's also a very low cost per page. Of everything that we've talked about in these printer technologies, this is the cheapest way to print. Because all it's using is this, this uh, ribbon that's going by with ink on it, and it's simply hitting that ribbon onto the paper. That's a very, very inexpensive way to create an image on a sheet of paper. Unfortunately, because it's physically using pins and hitting a piece of paper, very much like a very high-tech typewriter, it's very, very noisy. So you really can't use this in an environment that's sensitive to a lot of noise. There was an entire group of third-party products created for these types of printers that enclosed them in these soundproof containers just so you could have it in the middle of a floor in an office building. And because it is using these pins, you can imagine the graphical capabilities of these printers are extremely limited. You can't do 
a lot with very pretty pictures. And that's one of the valuable parts of laser printers of why they became so popular because the graphics were so nice compared to the older style of dot matrix printers. Another type of printer is a thermal printer. Thermal printers are used a lot in environments where you need something that's printed out for a very short period of time, something that's not going to be permanent. It uses this special white paper. And this special paper is very sensitive to heat. What happens is when you heat up a section of the paper, it turns black. So this, this thermal paper and the way that it operates allows us to have very, very quiet printing. As that head goes back and forth, since all it's doing is transferring heat, it creates almost no noise when that's happening. And so it's a lot quieter than a laser printer, quieter than an inkjet printer, certainly quieter than a dot matrix printer. So very useful in a business environment. Because it is so sensitive to light and to heat, that it does not make a very good use for permanent copies of things. So it's very useful for a receipt printer, for instance. The, the paper doesn't cost very much. And because there's, we're heating this up, there's no ribbon to speak of. But uh, if you ever put this in the dashboard of your car, you leave it somewhere that's hot, or even put things like clear, clear tape over these receipt printers, you'll find that they turn black and turn white, and they'll fade out over time. It's not something you would use to have something permanently connected to it. Another type of printer is the solid ink type of printer called dye sublimation. This dye sublimation printer uses multiple colors, and it puts one color on a sheet of paper at a time. And it uses different levels of color by sending different levels of heat onto this very special dye that's connected to these plastic sheets. What it does is this, this word sublimation is really taking the solid ink, and it's transferring it into this gaseous form so it'll connect with the paper without actually transferring it into a liquid. So it doesn't drip anywhere. So it's a very fancy technology in how it works. And it's very effective. It creates beautiful pictures when these things are coming out of a printer. The colors are just amazing. There's no true black, because what we're doing is combining blue and yellow and red together to create the colors we need. But even though the black is not true, unless you're taking a picture of a black screen, you'll almost never notice this. So the, the photographs you get are very vivid. Unfortunately, because they are using a very specific size of this paper that's used, this ink that's rolled out onto this paper, it's a very fixed media size that you're using. So we can't go much larger than this very tiny piece that we've got here. Very large dye sublimation printers, they're using very large sizes of ink rolls. But you are limited to how big those media can possibly be. You don't have a lot of flexibility that you do with other, other printer types. And you're wasting a lot of dye. When this thing is printed out, you've got a lot of dye that you simply didn't use. And unfortunately, you're not able to use these, these pieces of dye over again. It, it, and that's one of the problems you have with this type of printer. It's beautiful, but it's very wasteful in how it operates. This is also a security risk. This is probably why you don't see this type of printer used very much in enterprise environments, because you're essentially taking dye away from these blocks of color, and you're leaving an image behind. Let me show you what this looks like. This is something that you can find. If you go out to Wikipedia, this is an image that uh, was out there. And you can see that the print, at, the print itself is up here in the upper left, but notice we have what's left over from these inks that are right here. It's almost uh, We can almost make out exactly the words on the different cans. I bet if we had it in front of us with a magnifying glass, we could really get down into the details of what this picture looked like. So you don't want to put that into the garbage. This might have some very sensitive information on it. You put it in the garbage. You put it out. It's not destroyed. Somebody can pick that up and see what type of pictures you've been printing on that picture. So another reason to look for those types of security issues in large enterprise environments. Well, now that we've looked at the different kind of printers that are available and printer technologies, let's see what kind of scanner technologies we have out there. Scanners, for the most part, are simple devices. They're taking a picture of something that we would put inside of them. And the most common you see in many corporate environments and enterprise environments is the flatbed scanner. This is a picture of a flatbed scanner. You're lifting up the, the top of the flatbed scanner. You're putting your piece of paper onto a clear piece of glass, and you're closing it up, and it scans that image in. This works very similar to a copying machine in the way that it operates. But instead of outputting a piece of paper that a copier might do, it's outputting data. It's providing you with an image 
image on your screen. Another type of scanner that you'll see in very high-end scanning environments, especially used in archiving and high-end film scanning, are drum-type scanners. You don't really find those very much in enterprise environments, but if you happen to run across one, if somebody who's in a graphics art department or a marketing department, they may have a drum scanner there because they're providing very high-quality graphics off to be sent off to a, a magazine or to go into an advertisement. So it's useful to have something that does that at very high quality. Another type of input and output technology that's becoming extremely popular is the all-in-one device. This isn't mentioned specifically in the CompTIA exam certification notes, but it's useful because we're seeing so many of these in the environments that you know what they are. And in the end, they're technologies you're already familiar with. We've already talked about inkjet printers. Almost all of the all-in-one devices are inkjet or laser type printers. We've already talked about scanners. Many of them are flatbed scanners or scanners that we can pull the paper in through this automatic document feeder that's on the top. These are also fax machines. Thus, many of them have phones connected to them since they're already plugged into the phone line with your fax capabilities. Uh, they might have a wireless or cordless phone connected to it so you can walk around and it's using this one device as your telephone and your printer and your scanner and everything else you might need. So it's important to know that this technology is here, but it's very easy to use and troubleshoot. And uh, Just keep in mind that the printing part and the scanning part just happens to all be in one device instead of separated out into different devices. In review, we've looked at many different printing technologies. We've looked at LaserJet, we've looked at Inkjet, and many others. We've also looked into scanning and seeing how both the flatbed and the drum scanners are used in environments. And finally, we had a peek at some all-in-one devices. And we can see many more of those are going to be in home offices and even in larger enterprise offices as they become more popular. For more free A-plus videos, for message boards, and much more, you can visit our website, freeaplus.com.